Let's pray together. What a wonderful meditation for our hearts, O Lord, to contemplate you, the ancient of days, the one who was and is and evermore shall be. You transcend time. You are the author and maker of all things. You hold all things in your hand. And we love to be yours. We live in a tumultuous world, a cursed world, a broken world. And it is good to belong to you. You are bigger and scarier than every big scary thing that we may face. And you have set your love upon us. You have set your affections on us. You have set your promises on all who believe. And we trust you. And we don't know what the future holds. We certainly can know those things you have revealed. But you know all things. Every circumstance, every detail. You know what each one in this room faces. You know the burdens. You know the challenges. You know trials and persecutions and sickness and difficulty. And beyond that, Lord, you know every detail of every future moment of this universe. And we pray, confident, that all will proceed according to your plan. We love your plan. We we confess at times we chafe against the things you bring into our lives, and that is because we see dimly. Help our unbelief. I pray even as we look to the future this morning in your word that you would strengthen and solidify our feeble faith. And truly the the strength of all of this is not the strength of our belief, but the might of the one in whom we believe. Help us, O God, this morning as we look to your word. Give us by your Holy Spirit soft hearts, open eyes, open ears. We pray to be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you find your seats this morning, I would invite you to find your way in your Bible to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. This morning, we're beginning our study of the seventh chapter of this last book, and we are looking at the 144,000. 144,000 show up in the text we're studying this morning, and they've become sort of famous. It seems like most people in American culture know something about 144,000. Various cults throughout time have claimed to be the 144,000, ironically until their population exceeded 144,001. And then that number became a subset of that cult, Well, that that must be a special select group, but there are more of us. Who are these 144,000? What are they marked out for? What will they be doing? All of these questions are, I believe, clearly answered in the text we look at this morning. But as we begin our time, I, I want us to remember as we look toward future history that we're dealing with the Word of God, that which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and designed by God to have impact on our lives. You need to know that God will accomplish all His plans for the future, most of which He has not revealed. But He has revealed to us some things. We might profitably ask the question, Why should I know about 144,000 select Jewish males who will be evangelists during the tribulation? Why do I need to know about them? It's clearly not me. What is the import? And this gets to a fundamental question you ought to ask yourself when you hear the preaching and the teaching of God's word. It's a question you should be asking yourself when you open your Bible every morning. What do I learn here? What is God saying? What does this passage speak? And what import for my life? Does this matter? And I would suggest to you every time we open God's word, whether we're looking at something in the distant history or even the distant history of the future, that God has recorded it for our benefit. 
We know from the book of Romans that the things that were written down from the past were written for our instruction. I would suggest the same principle holds for the future. God, the author of history, has seen fit to reveal to us the future history of the world. And he could have just done all the things that he says and not told us. We could find out about it later. Perhaps that's appealing to think, well, it'll all work out in the end. I don't need these details. But God has seen fit to give us details and to do so for a purpose. My encouragement to you as you come to hear God's word, we will be in this future section for some time on Sunday mornings. But even as you open your Bible in any passage for yourself in the morning, God, what do I learn here about you? What do I learn about me? What do I learn about the world? And how should this affect my life? One thing I've been praying for myself and for this church comes out of the future section of the book of Revelation where the appeal from heaven is made to God's saints at that future time, come out from her. Come out from Babylon, the the mysterious, satanically driven world system that is opposed to God and his ways. Don't be a part. God is going to unleash judgment on that world system. You, his people, be different. One of the things I've been praying for myself and for this church is that future reality, even that future appeal, would resonate for us. That we would remember that the the world we live in is destined for judgment. A world full of rebellion against God will face the judgment of God, not only in eternity, but in a future period of calamity on this earth. What does that mean for us? Don't be worldly. Don't love that which God will destroy. And of course, we are to be in the world. One of the lessons for us in studying this 144,000 is we see a group of people, new birthed during the tribulation, sealed and set apart for the task of world evangelization in a time where it is harder than it will ever have been. And it will be successful. I hope that's an encouragement to us who live in relatively easy times. As hard as your own situations may be, as hard as the, it is to get the gospel out to people who seem like they just don't want to hear and don't want to believe, the world spins because God is still saving sinners. And I pray that this passage will give us courage even in our time as we look to that future time. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to put our eyes on the last few words of the last verse of chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 detailed for us the opening of the seal judgments. A great scroll in heaven, Jesus gets the scroll. It's something like the title deed to the earth. It is rightfully his. It belongs to him only to break the seals, open the scrolls, and unfold God's judgment against the world. And what unfolds is a series of cataclysms that come upon the earth. Six seals broken and six judgments given. A seventh seal is yet to be opened. And when that seventh seal is opened, seven trumpet judgments will sound. And the last of those trumpet judgments will open seven bowl judgments. This is a series of telescoping disasters for the earth from heaven. This is God's wrath. And we've seen the first six seal judgments opened. And at the conclusion of those, we have this rhetorical question. The great day of the wrath has come, and who is able to stand? What has happened so far? Worldwide war, anarchy, and violence, the breakdown of society, the interruption of of all of the chains of supply for food and provision across the world. There has been scarcity and famine and disease. The wild animals have been unleashed to attack the human population. There is a massive scourge of mortality. One quarter of the earth's population is destroyed in one judgment. Worldwide earthquakes, astronomical signs, darkness, panic. I don't know if you have imagined those scenes as we've been walking through these judgments. What will it be like to live in a world during that time? Hollywood cannot convey it. 
The first six seal judgments have brought unprecedented worldwide calamity. And rather than repent, the population of earth dwellers plead with the rocks to fall on them. You remember the small and the great all hid in the caves and they cried out to the rocks, collapse and bury us because we would rather die than repent. In fact, that anthem, death first rather than repentance and receive mercy from God, can be traced all the way through this period of time. It says a lot about the human heart. And these who have crawled into the caves, recognizing this is the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb, they say the day of their wrath has come. They utter this rhetorical question from the caves. Who is able to stand? I believe they intend that as a rhetorical question. No one can live through all of this. But this question actually has an answer. And chapter 7 is the answer. Who is able to withstand the judgment of God? Who will stand in the day of God's judgment? And the book of Revelation unfolds for us three groups of people who become objects of mercy in the midst of wrath. Three groups of people that become objects of mercy in the midst of wrath. We're only going to look at the first group this morning and we will call them the first fruits of tribulation mercy. The first fruits of tribulation mercy. That's the first half of chapter 7. In the second half of chapter 7, we will discover the tribulation martyrs. That's a group of people who come to faith during the tribulation and then die for their faith during the tribulation. And that group of people is populated by people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. I don't know if you've dreamed about world evangelism in a generation. How about world evangelism in a few years? It'll be the toughest time on the earth and yet God will have mercy on many. There is a third group and this unfolds later in the book of Revelation, but they are tribulation survivors. That is, they are those who come to faith in Christ during the tribulation and they survive all the events of the tribulation and they populate the millennial kingdom at the end. So three groups, some of these overlap. The first fruits of tribulation mercy we look at this morning in the first half of chapter 7. Chapter 7 is a bit of an interlude between chapter 6 and chapter 8. Uh, chapter 6 unfolded those seal judgments for us, ending in seal number 6. And then look over at chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal. Do you see that? So we have six seals up through chapter 6, a break in chapter 7, and then the seventh seal opened in chapter 8. Chapter 7 happens right in between these. This is a lull in the tribulation storm, and it has a purpose. God's purpose here is to set apart groups of people for gospel witness. Revelation chapter 7 presents two of those groups, the 144,000 Jewish first fruits and an uncountable number of martyrs from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. Look down at Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. After this, John records, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees, until we have sealed the slaves of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those having been sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 having been sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000, from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000, from the tribe of Levi, 12,000, from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000, from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000, from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000, and from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 having been sealed. This group 
described here in verses one through eight are the first fruits of tribulation mercy. And we'll look into chapter 14 in just a moment, but I am taking that label first fruits from the description of the same group of the 144,000 as we discover it in chapter 14. What we find here, according to verse 1 of chapter 7, is a pause in judgment. There's a pause in judgment. Look at verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Four angelic beings are depicted here at the four corners of the earth. Uh, Not that the earth is a rectangle, but simply the four directions, the cardinal points of the compass. And they are seen here holding back the winds of the earth, the winds that come from any which direction, so that no wind would blow. No wind would blow on the land, no wind would blow on the sea, no wind would blow on any tree. This is an interlude between the sixth and seventh seal judgments. It is a pause And this is an attention-getting pause. Could you imagine no wind on the earth? In the normal course of things, winds blow. The sun heats up the earth, and the differential pressure causes wind to move from places of high pressure to places of low pressure. The Coriolis effect of the earth's rotation in contrast with the sun beating down on the earth and heating up portions of the earth, sends winds spinning in the northern and southern hemispheres in great jet streams. These jet streams dip and they rise and they encounter various portions of the topography of the earth and they are affected. And it has been said that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Japan, a hurricane emerges in Florida. Who can control the wind? You think about the hydrological cycle that that God has provided for the earth where he would take water out of a salty sea, evaporate it into the sky, and drain it onto the earth as fresh, clean water for life. Happening day after day after day. A kind provision of the Lord for the operation of the earth. How would it get the meteorological attention if the wind stopped? This is supernatural. When it says here that the angels are, are holding back, they're, they're holding fast the winds, the, the picture given is that these winds are just ready to burst forth. The, the winds normally go. If you've ever lived near the coast, you, you know the daily change between an offshore and an onshore breeze. Air just has to move from high pressure to low pressure. It, it moves depending on temperatures. This is normal operation. What happens here in chapter 7 is very abnormal. It would be arresting. It would be stunning. It would be frightening. Consider after all the things that have happened so far for the hydrological cycle to cease, the, the jet stream to halt, the Coriolis effect to go away, all of it stops. And it's as if the earth is catching its breath in anticipation of more wrath to come. This is not a good omen. The winds of God's judgment will pick up again. But first, God has a purpose to fulfill and a people to prepare. No man can control the wind, but here God puts the brakes on all of it. There is not the slightest breeze while God gets his people prepared for the next phase of worldwide judgment. There's an encouragement for us in that. God has his people, God has his purposes. And God overrules nature. He's the sovereign ruler of all of nature. He keeps his people. He fulfills his purposes. Can you imagine what would happen between the sixth seal opening and the seventh seal opening when there is a pause? When everything stops, the judgments cease, and and even the wind comes to an abrupt halt. What do the hearts of men do? They had just been in caves crying out one with another, please fall on us rocks because we'd rather die. They had given up all hope. They were in despair. They were at the end of their tether. What happens when the judgment stops and the wind ceases? 
what will men do? The hard hearts of men will lead them out of their caves. They'll dust themselves off and they'll begin to say, hey, we made it. We made it through that. Never mind the quarter of the earth plus that just was decimated. But the survivors will say, hey, we're here. We're strong. We're tough. I think they will regain fortitude. And I think they will come up with natural, albeit blasphemous, explanations of things. In fact, our world is already being prepared for these kinds of things. What will they say? Oh, it's climate change. Popular movies have depicted nature as one day striking back against humanity. For all of humanity's crimes against the environment, nature will get you back. The trees will come and zap people away. Listen, Hollywood is preparing human hearts to have excuses other than what they know to be true. They've already acknowledged this is the wrath of God. What happens when the wrath relents? They get some reprieve. They walk out of their foxholes and they say, oh, no, we got this. Perhaps they will say aliens. Perhaps they'll blame an evolutionary purge of humanity. Whatever it is they will come up with, the unrepentant earth dwellers will crawl out of their caves when the wind stops, dust themselves off, pat each other on the back, gather their fortitude, and carry on. And how do we know this? Because the rest of the book of Revelation unfolds their dealings, immoralities, thefts, murders, sorceries, commerce. They'll just be back at it. We can cope. And there's nothing new here. Do you remember Pharaoh? ruler of Egypt, when God brought the plagues, with each successive plague, Pharaoh said, oh, please take it away. Ask your God to take it away. Moses prayed, God relented, Pharaoh had reprieve, and what? He returned to a hard-hearted recalcitrance not to obey the Lord, not to let the people go. Do you know this in your own heart? Consider your own experiences. Have you faced a tragedy that brought you low? A difficulty that brought you a time of humility, maybe even prayer, some resolutions? Maybe you've experienced an illness that caused you to cry out to God for mercy. Maybe you've received a serious diagnosis that has you thinking seriously about life for a few minutes. It gets your attention, you look up, you utter one of those foxhole prayers, but a little time goes by, you get a little reprieve, you get through the shock of bad news, you start coping with the situation, and you build up some resilience, you renew your fortitude, and your heart says, okay, Okay, that was a blow, but what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. In my own strength, I don't need God. I can continue to live without God. I've got this. Maybe I don't need Him to turn my life around after all. The crisis produced a kind of humility, but the reprieve reveals the heart. Let me ask you, what will it take for you to truly soften your heart before the Lord? If you found yourself going from hardship to hardship and then getting through without allowing those things to bring your attention to your greatest need, your need to love God first and most, your need to turn from your sinful ways, to turn from idolatries and and worship the true and living God, to have your life oriented to Him. If you have let all of God's kindnesses go by, and and that's what they are, trials, difficulty, illness, a diagnosis, those are God's kindnesses to you to draw your attention to the fact that your greatest need is not health, your greatest need is not your material prosperity, your greatest need is not the easing of some difficulty at work or the smoothing out of relationships in your family or friendships. Your greatest need is to know and love God, to be rightly related to Him, 
to no longer be a slave of sin, to walk out of darkness and into light. That's your greatest need. And if God has brought trial and difficulty into your life, that is his kindness to you. The alternative is to meet him face to face in unrepentance. And if you don't soften your heart, you will meet him face to face. And all you will have to offer him is all the garbage you brought to the table. Listen, friend. The Lord in his kindness brings hard things into your life to get your attention. Don't miss the opportunity to get right with him. Someone has said, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. I don't know who to attribute that to or I would give credit. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. It's a remarkable truth. Your circumstances don't create the condition of your heart. They reveal it. What do you do with difficulty? We see next in this verse the securing of servants in verses 2 and 3. John records, I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Not yet. This other angel comes from the east. From John's perspective on the island of Patmos, looking east would be towards Israel and Jerusalem. Maybe this is intentional to portray salvation is coming from that direction. And this other angel has the seal of the living God. Uh, The seal here, like the seals that held the scroll together, the word is used of the, the dab of wax that is melted and dropped onto something and then given an impression, often the signet ring of some royal. So a king would take his signet ring, put it into the fluid wax, and it would harden. And that, that hardened waxy seal was a mark of ownership. And it was a mark of security. Can't tamper with what's inside. It belongs to the king. And, and these are said to receive this seal. And this is the seal of the living God. And every time that title is used of God, it's an intentional contrast to the dead and worthless idols of all the other gods out there. Uh, This was true in the use in the Old Testament. The living God is a contrast to the stones and the sticks and the, 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 the things that were made by human hands. Those things made by human hands, of course, were the, were the outward idols, but they represented demons, they represented satanic ideology, and, and at the end, they represented the worship of self. Why does an idol worshiper worship an idol? To rub the lamp three times and get the genie to pop out and give me what I want. The worship of idols was, I will give the idol what the idol demands, whatever sacrifice I need to get by, so that I can get what I want. That is such a contrast to the worship of the true and living God. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't live in houses made by hands. He is the maker and sustainer of all things. We we never give to him as if he would be in debt to us. Oh, I have to come out of the lamp and do that thing that guy said because he did the thing. That's idolatry. And when you come out of every phony religion and when you retreat from the worship of self, to encounter a relationship to the one true God, you come into something fundamentally different than all of it. And so this seal is the seal of the living God and it is to go on those slaves who belong to him. And this prohibition was given to the angels who were granted to harm the earth and the sea. Think about that for a moment. There will be climate change. There will be environmental disasters at the behest of God and these four angelic beings are given specific authority to harm the earth and to harm the sea. They are stationed with authority to bring serious damage to the earth and this will come in rapidly increasing severity as the tribulation continues. What is the message? Don't harm the earth and the sea until the implication is trouble is coming. More trouble than we've seen even to this point. And look at verse 3. 
Do not harm the earth of the sea or the trees until we have sealed the slaves of our God on their foreheads. These slaves of God. What a wonderful title. It's the title of all who believe in God throughout Scripture. It's an Old Testament description of those who believed and were faithful. It's a New Testament description of those who believe and are faithful. By the way, slavery to God is so good. I know that word has the, the, the tinge of American history to it, where America participated in the colonial days and beyond in the European slave trade. But slavery to God is a belonging to and care from a really good master. He's in charge of all things. He owns all things. And out of love for his own, he laid his own life down. Jesus, the God-man, became the slave in order to rescue us out of slavery to sin. Think about that old slavery you were under before you knew Christ, where your old slave master only wanted you dead and in a life of deceived misery leading up to that death. The slaves here are the slaves of God. They are beloved, they are, in, they are friends, and they are inheritors of the household of God. And notice they are slaves first and sealed second. They are the slaves of God, and the angels are to hold back the winds of the earth until that other angel seals them. That's important for us to understand because the sealing here is not the sealing of new birth, regeneration, the sealing of the Holy Spirit that every believer experiences. This is a different kind of sealing for a specific people, for a specific purpose, at a specific time. This becomes important for us to understand. The, the sealed 144,000 here are not the totality of all that will get saved during the tribulation. They're not even the totality of all the Jews that will get saved during the tribulation. These are specific group of people who are sealed with a special seal for a unique purpose. This sealing is a unique provision from God. A supernatural protection for a select group. We'll find out in chapter 9 that these particular ones are sealed as a protection and preservation against some of the outpouring of God's wrath and against the persecution from the Antichrist. There's a supernatural protection. There's a parallel to this in the Old Testament in Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4. Marks were given on the foreheads of those who grieved at the spiritual bankruptcy in Jerusalem. So here were Jews living in Jerusalem during a time of religious apostasy. And there were some who looked around and said, Oh, we have forsaken the Lord. And they were grieved by it. They loved the Lord and they weren't like their surroundings. And in Ezekiel 9, these were marked on the forehead and spared the next destruction. It's an interesting parallel to the scene here. And this seal is, is different than another mark that happens during the book of Revelation. Turn over to chapter 13. Verse 16 describes the Antichrist. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, that they be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Uh, what is that number? 666, the next verse says. Uh, if you've ever feared that you've accidentally taken the mark of the beast, you haven't. It's still future. If you're concerned that it's out there and sneakily gotten into your computer somehow, it hasn't. Okay, the, the details are important. But what's interesting here is the seal in chapter 7 is a different word than the mark we just read. The, the mark in chapter 13 is the word used for branding or a tattoo. It's, a, it's an outward mark of ownership by the Antichrist. It is about power and control. It is not about love, protection, and preservation. 
And the Antichrist mark might let you go to Fry's and buy a bag of bread for about a sack of gold. But it will not protect you from the wrath of God. It actually marks you out for eternal destruction. This seal is a seal of love and protection and provision. This is a seal of electing grace. And listen, for the sake of God's people and God's purposes, the world is not yet consumed in Revelation 7. God's still going to get people for himself. And so the end has not yet come. Think about Noah during his day. Noah and his family were preserved while the world was destroyed in the flood. Lot was preserved when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. The Israelites were preserved out of Egyptian slavery while Egypt was decimated. And Rahab was preserved at Jericho because she believed. Throughout history, God has had his people. Even in the midst of mass calamity, there's been mercy. What's on display here? Wrath in the midst, or wrath coming on the earth, and mercy in the midst of that wrath. God's select people are preserved. In, chapters, in chapter 7, verses 5 or 4 through 8, we see the identity of these ones secured. I open this morning by asking the question who are these 144,000? And much speculation has gone out. In fact, if you were to get on the internet, I don't recommend this, uh, and ask who are the 144,000? You can find probably 144,000 different answers, most of them wrong. But it's not a mystery. This text actually tells us precisely who they are. I heard the number of those having been sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. These are ones out of all the tribes of Israel. And the detail of that preposition out of is important. This is not a a total figure of all the Jews alive during that day. It's not the total figure of all the Jews who will be saved during that day. This is a specific select group. We see them again in chapter 14. I want you to turn there. This is a look forward down the line of the future from chapter 7. And John writes, I looked and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion? That's the city of Jerusalem. When does the Lamb stand on Mount Zion in Jerusalem? At His return. Revelation 19, when He comes to the earth, leading into Revelation chapter 20 in the Millennial Kingdom. And with Him were the 144,000, having His name and the name of His Father written on their foreheads. That's probably an indication of what this seal displays. This seal, whether physically visible or not, is emblematic of the name, the identity of God the Father and of the Lamb. Verse 2, I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of, and this is one of my favorite musical verses in the Bible, harpists harping on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. And these are the ones who are not defiled with women. They are virgins. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been purchased from among men as firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. This is a pretty specific group. A specific group of Israelites who are males who have not been defiled in some very specific ways. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And where do they end up? On Mount Zion in Jerusalem with the victorious Jesus. What does all of this indicate for us? Um, They are converts during the tribulation who survive the tribulation and end up in victory with Jesus in Jerusalem at the end of the tribulation. Chapter 14 calls them first fruits. Now that's interesting. What, what is a first fruit? This was the, the first little bit of a harvest. 
And it was used in the religious context throughout the scriptures to describe that which was given first to God. And you have to understand, the the ones who come to faith during the tribulation are not the first people ever come to faith. Uh, They're not the first people ever to believe that Jesus was the Messiah and died in the place of sinners to bring us to God. They are the first during the tribulation to do so. And they are selected out by God. In fact, the same word for first fruits is used in 2 Thessalonians 2.13 for the first converts in Thessalonica. And in Romans 16.15 for Epinetus, the first convert in Asia. And in 1 Corinthians 16.15 for the household of Stephanus, who were the first converts in Achaia. And it's not used very many other times than these. It, it has a significant meaning referring to those early converts during the tribulation. What do we find out about them? They are a select group, a numbered group. They are protected throughout the tribulation. And as many have said, I, I think this first fruits idea lends to the, the credibility that these become witnesses or evangelists during the tribulation. If they are the first fruits of a great harvest, this tiny number, 144,000, becomes the seed for a gospel spread through the tribulation that will bring in a harvest from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. That we see in the second half of chapter 7. So their ministry will be effective. They are sealed and preserved for a purpose. There are many more than the 144,000 Jews that get saved. There will be females as well. There will be Jews uh, dispersed and persecuted. And the majority of Israel, I believe, do not come to faith in Christ until the end of the tribulation. But these are the first. It's an interesting parallel in Numbers chapter 31. We discover here in in Revelation 7 that 12,000 from each tribe, multiplied by 12, 144,000 of them, will be first fruits of the gospel during the tribulation, will be witnesses during the tribulation, and will survive the tribulation. Is that possible? Can such a thing even happen? Well, of course it can, if God has sealed them for such protection, and, and it has precedent. In Numbers 31, uh, Moses was leading a battle against the Midianites, And a thousand Jews from each tribe were selected in the fight. So there were 12,000 total. Listen to Numbers 31, 48 and 49. The officers who were over the thousands of the army, the captains of thousands and the captains of hundreds approached Moses. And they said to Moses, your servants have taken a census of men of war who are in our charge and no man of us is missing. Isn't that interesting? 12,000 went out to war, 12,000 came back. God preserved them. And he did so even according to the tribes. Something interesting about thinking about 144,000 having been sealed, 12,000 from each of the tribes listed. That is not the product of human free will. That's not accidental. That's not happenstance. This is an elective grace of God. It demonstrates something else for us, that God is not done with Israel. We go on in verse 5. Notice the details. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 having been sealed. And Reuben and Gad and Asher and Naphtali and Manasseh and Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph and Benjamin. Many have taken the first half of chapter 7 and the second half of chapter 7 and surmise that these two groups are the same group. Many theologians have said this is a representative of the church. A church that is victorious, a church that is martyred, but it's all the church. Uh, That's the main idea. The the problem with thinking that is is you have to overrule the details of the text. What you have in chapter 7, verses 1 to 8, is a numbered group of specific people, all male, who do specific things, 12,000 from each of the named and listed tribes. Look down at verse 9. After these things I looked. By the way, every time that phrase is used in the book of Revelation, after these things I looked, it is a scene change. Every single time that phrase is used. 
And behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and the Lamb, clothed in white robes. Their location is different, their number is different, their ethnicity is different. In fact, you couldn't get a more disparate description of two groups of people than these two groups. They're clearly not the same. Each has their purposes. What unites these two groups is elective grace and faith and specifically new faith during the time of the Great Tribulation. But here, these 144,000 are unique. Some have said, well, you know, the genealogical lists were destroyed with the temple in AD 70. How does anybody know what tribe they belong to? Uh, That's fair. Maybe you've asked that. Maybe you've heard that question. The reality is, God has the genealogical records, we might say, in the cloud. Oh, dad. Right, that was like a dad joke, right? God knows which tribes people belong to. He always has. He always will. And the reality is the nation will not fail in the end to be a witness for God in the world. It is the reason God set Israel apart. That the nations might know that the God of Israel is the one true God. God will keep his promise. Let every man be a liar. God will be true. Some have protested, but this list of tribes appears funny. It it doesn't look like all the other lists of the tribes. And and if you've ever walked through your Bible and just made a list of all the the tribes, all the sons of, of Israel, you'll come up with 19 different ways the tribes are described. There is no normalized list of the tribes that this one has to conform to. You might think, well, that's funny. I mean, aren't there just 12 tribes? Well, aren't there just 12 apostles? But minus Judas, plus Matthias, plus Paul, is that 11, 12, or 13? I don't know. (laughs) Something similar goes on with the tribes of Israel. You remember that Reuben lost his birthright, and Joseph ends up with a double portion. Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, become something like half-tribes. And so sometimes the list of 12 names has no Joseph, but it has Ephraim. Or no Joseph, but it has Manasseh. Sometimes Dan is missing. Why is Dan missing from the list in 1 Chronicles 30? And why is Dan missing from the list in Revelation 7? The text doesn't tell us. We do know that Dan shows up in the geographical distribution of the list in Ezekiel 48 in the Millennial Kingdom. There's grace. But we also know that Dan was the entry point for idolatry in Israel. You can read Judges 18. And so is there, is there something to the way these lists are written that is actually theological and pointed? And I think you can go to each one of the lists and determine from the context, why is this list look different than the others? It's not a signal that you should ignore the details and make this metaphorical and make it the church. There's actually a rich theology in the list of the 12 tribes throughout Scripture. And that's a sermon for another time. Have you heard of the lost tribes of Israel? That's sort of a, a Western civilization colloquialism. The lost tribes, who are they? Are they the Aztecs, the Incas, the Mayans? You know, the Mormons historically said that the North American Indians were the lost 10 tribes. And before that, um, Christians in Europe said that white Europeans were the lost 10 tribes of Israel. There, there's no lost 10 tribes. According to Second Chronicles, the, the northern tribal factions uh, made their way down to Jerusalem, made their way down and lived in Judea in the vicinity of the two southern tribes. And by the time you get to the New Testament, even though there, there was no united monarchy, people knew what tribes they were from. Paul, for instance, knew he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Right? These things were known in the first century. God knows who they are. They're not lost. God still has his purposes and his plan. Furthermore, Jesus promised the apostles that they would judge the 12 tribes of Israel sitting on 12 thrones, Luke twenty two thirty. If we go back to the end of chapter 6 and ask this question, 
The great day of the wrath of God has come, and who is able to stand? Who will be left standing when God judges the earth? The saved and the sealed. That's the answer. And the populations of that group show up in three fashions in the book of Revelation. The Jewish first fruits of tribulation mercy we looked at this morning. If Jesus doesn't return for his church this week, Lord willing, we will look at the tribulation martyrs next Sunday. And then there will be the tribulation survivors, that is, those who come to faith, perhaps on the basis of the testimony of the 144,000 people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people who end up surviving the great tribulation and walk into Jesus' kingdom according to Matthew 25. There are the sheep and goats judgment. The sheep on one side, the goats on the other side. The sheep, alive, mortal, believing, get ushered into Jesus' glorious kingdom on the earth. And the unbelieving, who survive the battle in Revelation 19, are judged and cast into fiery judgment. Okay, how do we read our Bibles? How do we think through, what, what does this passage say? Why is it in my Bible? What is its importance for my life? This passage simply says, God will save and seal for a specific purpose 144,000 Jewish males early during the tribulation. Why is it in your Bible? Because God wanted you to know it. God wanted you to encounter this information. He could just do it and not tell us. We could find out about it after it happens. What is its import for my life? Why is it in my Bible? At the risk of, of stepping on the toes of the Holy Spirit here, I, I believe God uses His Word in our lives in ways far better, far greater than any preacher could dream up. I, I like to come up with ways that this impacts my life, I'll, I'll miss some of the things God's word is doing by the power of his spirit in your lives. But let me suggest a few things. Here's a principle. Nothing can hinder the purposes of God. Not a world that is completely bonkers, off access, in chaos, in anarchy and rebellion, rebellion against God. If God sees fit to still save sinners, the world will still spin and there will be mercy in the midst of wrath. Secondly, nothing can harm the people of God. Not in any ultimate sense. Do not fear those who kill the body. What can they take from me? Just my life. But my life is hid with God in Christ. I'm a citizen of heaven. Fear rather the one who kills the body and soul in hell. Let me suggest to you on the, on the example of the 144,000, that living up to your purpose in life does not depend on your comfort, your ease. It does not depend on perfect health or financial resources. At that time in world history, the world will be the worst it's ever been. It will not be comfortable. And yet they can live out their purpose for their existence by the grace of God in life. Argument from the worser to the better, the greater to the lesser, um, I think we can live out the purposes God has for us regardless of the circumstances. Sometimes you feel like your life's purpose is to achieve some level of prosperity or comfort or an even keel in your relationships. God has purposes for his people that transcend all those things. Here's another thought. You, you may feel alone in following Christ at times, abandoned by friends, mocked, rejected, perhaps ignored by your own family, but you need to know you're not alone. God is with you. Jesus promised to never leave you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Do you remember the promise of God to Elijah in the days of Ahab? I have 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah thought he was alone in the world. God has his people. Think about the future. God will say, I have 144,000 who follow the Lamb faithfully during the world's darkest hour. Think about this, believer. When God comes to judge, when God sits on His glorious throne, when lives are assessed, when the world as we know it comes to an end, believers will stand. Jude 25. 
God is able to make you stand in his presence blameless with great joy. By contrast, Psalm 1.5, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. I take comfort from 2 Timothy 2.19. The firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4 both describe us as believers now in the church age, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, sealed for the day of redemption, sealed with the spirit of promise. And in 2 Corinthians 1, Paul says that God gave us the Holy Spirit as a pledge. There's a parallel for us. None of us in this room are the 144,000. But saved, sealed, and witnesses, we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness to us. To rescue us out of this world system. To make us your own. To call us by your own name. Lord, what a privilege it is to be yours, to be sealed for the day of redemption by your own Holy Spirit. What a privilege it is to have been arrested at some point in life, to have been brought to the ends of ourselves and brought to grace. Lord, many of us didn't even know we were slaves of sin when we were there. And yet you rescued us and brought us into a glorious slavery and sonship in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would receive all glory and we pray that we would walk out of this room eager to be your witnesses in a world that still spins where you are evidently still bringing people to yourself. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.